Heavenly Father, that your breath that's in our lungs, it's you who give us the strength to live each day. How amazing and how great you are. And we don't have anything that makes us worthy of that greatness. So we just give you what little we have. A hallelujah, a praise for all that you do for us. In your son's name, amen. You can be seated. So, Roger's series was amazing. I don't know how many of you were here for each night, or even just one night, or if you were watching online. His messages hit right where they were needed. Uplifting, the music was great. And as I started thinking, well, what in the world? Am, how am I going to follow that up? My first thought was to let Jim do it, because Jim did a great job filling in up here on stage, but I have a feeling Jim was probably going to say no to that. So I thought about the fact that it wasn't long ago I did a sermon series on the book of Proverbs, looking at wisdom for our life. And for some reason, I, I felt a call to not stop a message on wisdom. So I decided to, what other book in the Bible looks at wisdom? And as I was looking in the New Testament, there's a New Testament book that's almost called the, the wisdom book of the New Testament, and it is the book of James. So we're going to walk through the book of James, and I say walk because it might take a little while. James is only five chapters long, but as of this moment, this is an 11-week sermon series. So when I say walk, we're going to walk. You call it a journey, a slow walk. See, the book of James is full of practical, in-the-trenches counsel and advice for following Jesus. Sometimes it's pretty direct, in your face, maybe even blunt, which means that if you let it, James will shape your life, perhaps in, in a way that no other book of the Bible can. It's written by James, who was the half-brother of Jesus, a later son of Mary and Joseph, who ultimately became the head of the Jerusalem church. I thought I'd give you a little bit about James, a little background into him. He was one of the select individuals that Jesus appeared to after his resurrection. He was called the pillar of the early church, and the other leaders looked up to him. When the apostle Paul, on his first visit to Jerusalem, he went immediately to see James. He did the same on his last visit. To Jerusalem. When Peter was rescued from prison, he told his friends to be sure and tell James. He was a, a leader of the important council of Jerusalem. Tradition has it that he had a nickname. His nickname, according to tradition, was Old Camel Knee. Not a very good nickname, except for the fact how he got it was the calluses on his knees from constantly being in prayer. Tradition also has it that he was martyred through beheading. He was a remarkable man, and so is his contribution to the New Testament. So let's jump in. Starting with John chapter 1, beginning with verse 1. It says, This letter is from James. Greetings, dear brothers and sisters. When troubles come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. For so let it grow. For when 
your endurance is fully developed. You will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. So what is the biggest issues facing our lives? Maybe troubles, tough times, difficulties. Maybe you're out of work. Maybe you're in a troubled marriage. Maybe the test came back from the hospital with a positive when you didn't want to hear that. See, life is real. And it comes at us hard, and it comes at us fast. And that's where James starts, getting right into the thick of where we live. He doesn't waste any time. He jumps right in. So how, how do we respond? to the tough times. Most of the time, if we're honest, we get mad. Or we get bitter. Or maybe we play the victim card or the, or the blame game. But James gives us a radically different response. He says, consider it an opportunity for joy. Now, the first time you heard that or the first time you read it, you may have been wondering, what in the world is this guy smoking? But remember, this is wisdom from the trenches of a life that has been spent following Jesus. So let's hear him out. First, he says that we should consider troubles an opportunity for joy, not joy itself, don't misread him there. It's an opportunity for joy. He's not saying to put on a fake smile and act like everything's fine. He's not saying that you should be happy about the difficulties. Don't confuse happiness and joy. Happiness is based on the circumstances. It's driven by emotions, but joy is is deeper. It's based on how you think about something, not how you feel about it. So James says you should have joy when the challenges come because of what they can allow to happen in your life. Look again at what it says in verse 3. If you need, or for all you know, that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, for when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. I'm ahead. James says, let's talk about real faith. A growing faith that takes challenges to produce. See, when you face a challenge, a trial, a difficulty in your life, you have a choice. You can either endure or you can quit. If you endure, then you're going to grow. You'll mature. You'll be something bigger, better, brighter, deeper, and stronger than you ever were. James says that you will become perfect. Not in the sense of sinless perfection, because none of us will reach that here on this earth, but in the sense of being who you were made to be by God. And that's the joy. But it only comes through trials. So when the joy comes from God, from what God can accomplish in your life through those trials, see, our pain is often what has developed us, what has strengthened us, what has allowed us the ability to grow. That is, if we let it. Trials create a moment to either develop perseverance or to become a quitter. A life in Christ 
that, that means something, that's real, that is, is the one that has chosen again and again to persevere. And that's what James is talking about here. How trials bring your faith to the surface for testing and development in a way that nothing else can. Because in a trial, you're either going to turn to God or you'll turn away from Him. See, first comes the challenge, a trial. Then comes an opportunity to endure. Then if we choose to endure, we will grow will become mature, and will become who we were meant to be. It's a pretty tall order, isn't it? Who of us can do that on our own? None of us. Not a single one of us can do that in our own power and in our own strength. And that's where James keeps giving us wisdom. Because what he writes next is, if you need wisdom, ask our generous God, and he will give it to you. He will not rebuke you for asking, for when you ask him, be sure that your faith is in God alone. Do not waver, for a person with divided loyalty is as unsettled as a wave of the sea that is blown and tossed by the wind. Such people should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. Their loyalty is divided between God and the world, and they are unstable in everything that they do. See, James is telling us that if you need help, if you don't know what to do, if you can't seem to figure out how to hang on any longer, God stands ready to help you. He will meet any effort for his sake with absolute, utter, complete generosity. Notice how James put it. He said, ask our generous Father, the one who is eager to supply what it, whatever it is that you need. Then he says that God who won't rebuke you for needing it. It's not like God's going to say to you, you need help again? What's wrong with you? It's maybe how we react sometimes, but God will never react that way. He wants us to come to him in just this way whenever we have a need. So you can and should go to God with your confusion, with your hurts, with your anxiety, with your weakness, with your sense of not knowing which way is up. You can be real with God, authentic with Him, small with Him, weak with Him. And God will give you, what you whatever it is you need to endure. And notice what kind of help James says to go to him for. Not a safety net. That's often what we would want. We'd want that safety net to know that we won't ever hit rock bottom. But what James says is to go to him for wisdom. The wisdom to know how he wants us to handle it. Wisdom to know how to persevere, how to endure. He will help you make the correct decisions to know what to do and what not to do. He will give you what you need most, which is the wisdom to do whatever it takes to endure the trials that you're going through. He'll help you to know how to get through it. See, hear what James is saying. Endurance is won or lost on whether you ask for this wisdom and then whether or not you follow the wisdom. Because God's wisdom may not be our wisdom. 
His way through it may not be our way through it. But his way is the way through it. But for this to work, it takes something. You can't do it half-heartedly, half in, half out, as a last resort method kind of way. You have to come to God as God. You have to come to him as plan A, not just one of many options that you've been considering. You can't go to God one day with your challenge, then abandon him the next day, and then when that doesn't work out, come back to him and say, God, help me again. He wants us to go to him to decide whether either you're going to go his way through God or you're not. Commit to following him. You're either going to look to God as God alone for per perseverance, for that wisdom, or you're not. You can yell at him. You can shake your fist at him. You can bury your head in his shoulder and cry until you don't have a tear left in your body. But it's all to him. Because he is our God. And you have absolute confidence in his character. Our characters are flawed, but his is perfect. You've settled, you've determined that there's nowhere else to turn. No one else you want to turn to. See, the word that James uses here in the original Greek that is translated as divided loyalty literally means two souls, meaning that person's basic allegiance and faith is not settled. So when he talks about the wave being unsettled, that means restless. And when you approach God with that type of disposition, when you're unsettled, when you don't commit to him, you're not approaching him as God. See, those who haven't committed their life to God, they shouldn't expect to receive what God alone can give because they don't have a relationship with God. They're not really coming to him as God. Their inner world is unstable. Perhaps that's where you find yourself at today, in an unstable inner world. You don't know what's going on. You've been hit hard. You've been dropped to your knees. You've turned to everyone that you can think of everything that you can think of in order to get through it, but none of it seems to work. So why not? Why don't you take your challenge, take your trouble, take your trials to the only one who can help you get through it? Take it to Jesus. Now what James writes next seems to be switching gears, like it should be a new paragraph, a new, a new verse, a, a new topic. But, he's, but it's actually not. We pick up in verse 9, and it says, Believers who are poor have something to boast about. For God has honored them. And those who are rich should boast that God has humbled them. They will fade away like a little flower in the field. The hot sun rises and the grass withers. The little flower droops and falls and its beauty fades away. In the same way, the rich will fade away in all of their achievements. Doesn't that seem like it's a completely different topic than what we were just talking about? But James knows that in bringing all of this up, there are some of us who will see people going through tough times as a kind of punishment. And there'll be those who are living life without any difficulties who will see themselves as somehow being favored or blessed 
by God. Instead of seeing the deeper truth, that those who face the toughest of times are actually being given the opportunity of becoming more and more like Jesus. See, it's in those tough times and the difficulties that we are transformed that our lives become more like His. Instead of seeing that deeper truth, that's what matters. And, and that relationship, that ability to become like Jesus is all that we're going to take out of this world. Our money won't survive. If your house burns down tonight, if your boat is, is destroyed, your clothes, your jewelry, no matter what you have, no matter what you put your faith in, it won't survive this world. Only your soul, only your character, only your spirit. So don't get confused about what's really going on in your life. God is in the soul-making business. Don't envy the ones who are free from trouble. Look at the ones who are barely hanging on, that are hanging on with all that they got to Jesus. Envy them. Because here's what James adds in verse 12. He says, God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. Don't ever forget that in the end, if we endure, we will receive the only crown that matters, the, the only reward, the only honor that counts. And that phrase used by James as a crown of life is the kind of laurel wreath that would be given to winning a race, maybe an Olympic race. It's the gold medal. That crown of life was a, was a crown that would be given to somebody for winning the race, making it through a competition. And then James adds one more thought. One, to make sure that we don't get any of this out of whack. He says that when you go through dark times, when you're pursuing endurance, you're going to be tempted to not endure. You're going to be tempted to do a lot of non-God, anti-God, embarrassed God type of things. You're going to want to give up and give in. You're going to want to see your trials as an excuse to sin. You're going to tell yourself that the test has been too hard. And if you give in, you're going to look for someone to blame, and the most likely care candidate for that will be God himself. We'll blame him for all of our troubles. But James says, starting in verse 13, he says, And remember, when you are being tempted, do not say, God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong. And he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions. And when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. James is wanting us to see that just like the choice to endure is ours, the choice and the choice to ask for wisdom is ours. The choice to screw up and to sin in the midst of it is also ours. God does not tempt us to sin. He may challenge our faith, but he never tempts us to sin. 
James states it as clear as possible. First, it begins with our own desires. Then that desire, if left unchecked, leads to sin, a willful act, a conscious choice. Then that sin, if not owned, confessed, and turned from, will lead to death, spiritual death. Which is why endurance, is not just about the challenges, the tough times, or the troubles. It's about resisting the sin that can creep in when we're facing those challenges. You may sin in, in the midst of trying to endure, but don't blame it on God. Own it. Then ask God to forgive you and to help you to get back into the race. Because endurance is a process. It's about a long obedience in the same direction. You may stumble, you may fall, but pick yourself back up and keep going. Continually choose to stay true to who God is. Which brings James to his conclusion. In verse 16, he says, So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect comes down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word. And we, out of all creation, became his prized possessions. That's how James begins his letter. When we're presented with difficulties in this life, it can become a God moment, a time to become who we were meant to be, who we were created to be. We can become his prized possession. I don't know about you, but I want to be his prized possession. See, the joy is in the endurance that leads to completion. That's the life we've been called to live. A life that can meet trial with the knowledge that it can be met with endurance with the help of a father to make it across that finish line. A father who comes not because of our strength, but because of our need. So today, whether you're watching online or here in person, if you want to make a commitment to become his prized possession, If you want to make that commitment, if you're here in the room, will you stand up if you want to be his prized possession? And if you're watching online, if you want to make that decision to be his prized possession, just comment, prized possession, as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that that you have given James this book to write to us, to, to show us how we can come to you. That we should consider it joy when when those challenges come because we know that when we come to you, you are a generous God. You will give us whatever it is we need when we ask for it. You will give us whatever it is we need so that in the end, we can become your prized possession. Lord, I need you. We all need you. Thank you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen.